Good night, everybody. This is a lecture for Music 110. Uh, this will be on the early Romantic period, which is the next period that we'll get involved with. Uh, I want to talk about the Romantic and its importance. Uh, the entire period lasts over a hundred years, but most uh, teachers will break it down into the early Romantic and the late Romantic. And I intend to do that because what you have is you have composers born early in the century, uh, and then you have composers born either later in the century or that were more prominent later in, in the century. We're dealing from roughly 1800 to 1900. Uh, after that, we see the beginning of what's known as the 20th century, and we'll talk about that some later, the 20th century music, that is. But first of all, uh, we're coming out of the classical period. And there we talked about Haydn, and we talked about Mozart, and we talked about Beethoven. We gave most of the attention to Mozart because he was considered the quintessential classical composer. And Beethoven, whereas a lot of people you know, prefer Beethoven over uh, Mozart, I want to put Beethoven as that bridge composer from the classical period into the Romantic period because what he did that I really think was, um, I think it was his main contribution, was his inspiration to future composers of the Romantic. Beethoven was a guy who, extremely talented, um, he used to have he would go to parties, I guess I should say, and he would compete against other composers. And they would have what jazz will later call head-cutting sessions, and he seemed to always win and outplay the others. Uh, but I think there's a couple of tragic things in Beethoven's life. Usually we think of the fact that he went deaf. Uh, his deafness was tragic, but I must say it didn't affect his composition a great deal because after he was deaf, really about the time he was writing his sixth symphony, he was going deaf. And the sixth symphony really belongs to the Romantic period. Uh, but his greatest work was written when he was completely deaf, the ninth symphony. Uh, compared to uh, Mozart, who wrote over 40 symphonies and operas, uh, Beethoven only wrote nine symphonies and one opera, which wasn't that well received. Uh, he spent most of his time doing piano works and sonatas and that sort of thing. Uh, but the other tragic thing about him, and I think the people of Vienna who had seen Mozart die and realized that they had allowed a great musician to die before their very eyes as a pauper. And it's like, here's Beethoven, who Mozart had said this would be the next great thing to watch, person to watch. Uh, I think they felt sort of guilty and they wanted to make sure Beethoven didn't leave. And so a consortium of businessmen got together and they made an offer to Beethoven. They said, uh, we'll cover all expenses. In other words, we will be your patron without ruling over you. Uh, if you promise one thing, and that is stay in Vienna and write your music here. Uh, they provided him with lodging. They provided him sort of an open ticket to restaurants and to tailors. And he, he pretty much could have whatever he wanted. Uh, and then he write his music, he could sell it and perform. But the, the sad thing was, I think this is what caused him to write less because face it, if someone is paying all expenses and all comforts uh, just for you to write music, that really doesn't give you a great inspiration to write because you've got everything you need. Uh, hence, I think is why he only wrote nine symphonies. Now those nine symphonies were brilliant. And he wrote uh, a lot of what we call preludes which the preludes I enjoy probably more than the symphonies, but uh, we we lose Beethoven for a while that he just stopped writing. Uh, what was going on there was some drama in his life, uh, and it's still a mystery, but it's a it's a captivating mystery that he his brother married a woman and Beethoven met her immediately called her well a very unflattering name. I'll just tell you he called her a whore. Uh, this, of course, caused a rift in the family. Uh, she got pregnant and had a son, and Beethoven then began to say that the son was his son. And when his brother died, 
he on his deathbed, Beethoven got him to sign custody over the boy to him. Well, the mother went and they fought in court, but Beethoven with his pull with the people of Vienna, of course, won, and he made the allegation that she was an unfaithful wife. Uh, the child ran away from Beethoven because Beethoven was a terrible father. He would beat the child. He was brutal to him. The other thing, he forced him to go to church and wanted him to be very religious, while at the same time, we know that Beethoven was carrying on various affairs with his students and that sort of thing, and he had a, an outlandish temper. He was like a spoiled child in Vienna. Uh, eventually, the child will grow up and leave him, and he tries to go back to his mother later in life, and they go back to court again. And in the courtroom, and it would make a great courtroom drama, Beethoven accuses her of being a woman of the streets and says, even now, she's pregnant with another child. Now, they brought her, put her back on the stand. They asked her, I said, are you pregnant? She said, yes, I am. Who's the father? She wouldn't say, uh, but she wasn't married. So that, that just ruined her. The One of the great mystery elements of this was when the child was born, it was a girl. And guess what? She named the girl. She named the girl Ludwiga. And you have to ask yourself, why would you name your daughter after the most hated man in your life, Ludwig van Beethoven, and you name the child Ludwiga? Uh, this is called speculation. People wonder if maybe Beethoven knew her prior to the marriage uh, and to his brother. And could that child actually have been Beethoven's? And was the second child actually Beethoven? But obviously he didn't want to be married to her. He didn't want anything to do with her other than maybe having children with her. Nobody knows. Nobody ever knows. It's just a, it's a fascinating story. But during this period where he was raising his supposed son, which was his, either his nephew or really was his son, he, he wrote very little. He was inspired by Napoleon, but then when Napoleon became wanted to become emperor, he lost that inspiration. Uh, he did go deaf. And like I said, he wrote three symphonies after his deafness uh, and countless other pieces. So in that respect, he, he has a very tragic and yet inspiring life. The inspiration part is what he gives to the romantic composers that we're talking about. All of them were inspired. Now, the other, I guess, same big contribution was Mozart was probably the last of the great composers to compose for harpsichord. He played the piano some, but harpsichord was his instrument of choice. Uh, Beethoven wanted to play the piano because on the piano you have a wider range of notes. Plus, by hitting the notes harder or softer, you can put emotion into it. And Beethoven was a master of emotion on the piano. And if you listen to his pieces, you can hear the, the solace and somberness in the Moonlight Sonata. Um, or the power in what he's written in some of the symphonic things. Uh, anyway, Beethoven brings us into this romantic period. Now, if you'll look at the PowerPoint and follow with me, I've put some things in here because uh, the romantic period is a lot about music. Of course, it's a music course. But to understand the music, you need to understand what's going on in society. I always tell you that. You know, music is our window into the world and to time. Uh, I start this slide presentation off with a statement that says, a gradual paradigm shift in thought begins and extends for 200 years. The paradigm shift I'm talking about is the Enlightenment, which started during the classical period, is still going on. Uh, but if you remember in one of the lectures, I said history is like a pendulum. It swings back and forth. Earlier periods, it went from religion to uh, secularism, written back to religion. That's sort of out the window. Now we're going from emotion to logic. And the logic is the age of reason, but now we're going to swing over into the emotional age. We're going to bring with it the sonata form that uh, Mozart gave us. And music is going to be more formalized and structured but we're going to begin to experiment with harmonies. A lot of that is due to Beethoven again. But what I'm talking about philosophically, you haven't been Immanuel Kant. Uh, 
who is a philosopher. He's born 1744 and goes through 1804. So he's right at the end of the classical, end of the beginning. And he talks about reason should be the basis of morality. That's just a sort of an encapsulation of his thought. Uh, some people will read Kant and they love what he has to say. Others, they argue with him. Uh, I've read some of Kant's work and I think it's pretty good. Uh, I like his ideas. Uh, and the idea of reason is something that we need to hang on to. Oddly enough, this period starts off in reason but goes to emotion. And then early 20th century comes back to reason. But now here we are in the 21st century. And if you look around philosophically, oh, pardon me, I forgot to put this on. Do not disturb. And I just had a phone call come in. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going back to emotion now, and we live in an age where emotion is more important than anything, about how you feel and what you want to see as opposed to what you really see. Uh, the other person I mentioned is Wilhelm Hegel. Uh, he was born in 1770 and died in 1831. This guy, a lot of people don't know much about him. Uh, he was a philosopher. He's also a teacher. And Hegel's ideas uh, were, and by the way, he's not, He's not an evil person. It's just that some of his ideas were taken by modern uh, people, particularly in Germany in the early 20th century. And I like to say they were misused to justify extremist behavior. And Hitler talked about Hegel. He thought Hegel had the right idea that uh, Germany was superior and people, certain groups were better than others. And so Hegel uh, was literally just sort of perverted. But these two guys and their philosophies will become one of the dominant things. Now, from there, I go to a page, and I just talk about some of the one-liners that we'll see. Like I say, from faith to reason. That started in the classical period. It continues into the romantic period, where reason and thought are more important than Christianity. But that slowly changes, because they go from reason to a self-centered consciousness. In other words, people begin to look at themselves, uh, and I say on down there, yeah, later on, I'll tell you, narcissism becomes a big thing. Um, this next bullet may be a little confusing, but like I say from self to being to non-being, and that's a progression. You think about yourself as a reasoned physical being, and then you think about who you really are, and that's what being is. Uh, it's, you know, we are... Uh, a physical person, but who are we as a as a being? And that, that gets in our philosophy and our spirituality. Uh, and so they went that track, and then they get to the point of non-being. And what's going on there is the idea of search for reality. What is real? And you have, I'm sure you've heard people say, well, uh, are we real or are we just a dream that someone else is dreaming and things like that? and people set forth these things. That's sort of where they're at. The emphasis on science gives way to an emphasis on supernatural things. Um, in the early part, particularly, you have this, this desire to focus on the supernatural. This will be the age of seance, and that will carry on through the 1800s. Um, I say here, existentialism goes from the lab to the seance. In other words, we talk about existence, Existentialism talks about our existence, and now they try to move away from physical existence into a spiritual existence. Uh, people want to communicate with the other side. Uh, narcissism to socialism. Uh, Karl Marx will be writing uh, his ideas during the middle part of this. Darwin is writing during the middle part of this period, pardon me, I didn't say period. Uh, but socialism is, will be planted in the seeds of Marxism. And they go from narcissism, which is all about me. Uh, and when that begins to die out, they begin to think about the society as a whole. It's like, uh, it's sort of that humanism coming back to say, we're part of the whole. And Marx saw that and he said, well, a utopian society, which by the way, is not a new thing. Remember Thomas More wrote about utopia. Plato even wrote about a utopian idea. They, they all thought that, Utopia could only be achieved in a society where rather than as individuals, we work collectively together. And so out of this comes the idea of socialism would be perfect. If everybody worked and shared 
nobody uh, was richer or poor. Everybody was at the same level. It's the dream of socialism, which we still see today. Um, and sadly, I think it's being taught to you as students as this is the perfect model of life. Everybody working together, everybody being equal, uh, a socialist society is the best society. I hear people come on television, socialism will win, communism is better. Uh, that shows the naivete of modern socialist ideas because the socialism of Marx was beefed up by Lenin. And the socialism we see today is not utopianism because it's basically a lie. Uh, look at Russia, for instance. It's in the headlines all the time as a socialist nation. But if you look at Russia closely, it's run by oligarchs, the, quote, evil rich that people in this country are always saying, oh, we, if we were socialists, we'd get rid of the evil rich. Well, the most socialist country in the world is run by the oligarchical evil rich. And there's nothing they can do about it because they clamp down with the military. Uh, I saw a picture of Putin the other day on his yacht drinking champagne while the people in Russia are suffering through sanctions and stuff. Socialism has never worked. And yet you still have even college professors saying it's a better form. It's just never been done right. Well, we can say that about everything. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, whenever you have socialism, you always develop an upper level of people that rule. In this country, we have the, quote, evil rich. Somebody said, well, we have to do this to the evil rich. Uh, that's sort of a lie that's being told because the evil rich are the job creators. And the fact that they're rich, doesn't everybody want to be rich? I mean, people are in college to get better jobs. Why? So you'll make more money. You want to be rich, but since you don't have it, you point fingers at those that do have it and say, well, they've got my money or they're blocking me. That's not true. Uh, there's various ways that people get rich. America has more millionaires than any country in the world. We also have, I think it's 700 billionaires in this country. And uh, we haven't quite got a trillionaire yet, but we're headed that way. Uh, I heard something on the news the other day that people, you know, they always say the, the rich should pay their fair share. Well, Elon Musk pays like $50 million in taxes. He says, I pay my fair share. One year he paid no tax at all and everybody got upset, but they didn't realize he had taken $20 million, put it in the bank. And for two years, he lived off that money. He had no income for two years. You say, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. He had money and he didn't work. I'm like, he worked, but he made no income. So he didn't pay income tax. So everybody says, oh, he needs to pay his fair share. Well, in those years that he didn't pay income tax, he paid a corporate tax through the nose, 50 some million dollars. So it's all a political myth to say that these people are bad. Uh, meanwhile, you may not know this, but you realize that 57% of the taxpayers in this country last year paid no tax at all. They're not the evil rich. That's you and I. We paid no income tax because we took advantage of the same tax loopholes that the rich take advantage of. You know, they have the tax loopholes. Every year, the politicians say, stick it to the rich. Well, I would say, if you really want to stick it to the rich, take away their loopholes and they'll be paying tax. But for some reason, the politicians will not do that. This is the corporate greed that filters down into politics and everything else. We need to open our eyes. Now, I didn't mean for this to be a political speech, but what I'm getting at is in the Romantic period, all this stuff begins to ferment. It's headed toward what will be later called the Gilded Age, the end of this period where the Industrial Revolution kicks in and we'll be creating the captains of industry. And they do it, you know, off the back of child labor and things like that. That's true. But we clean that up in the 20th century. But here's where it starts. Um, now, the next influence I wanted to mention, which sometimes gets skipped over, is a guy by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. Y'all heard of him. The French Revolution starts in 1789. And I don't know what you know about the French Revolution, but it was chaotic. It was horrible. It is in no way equal to the American Revolution, even though they happen about the same time. Uh, the American Revolution was a lot nicer in a way. The French Revolution was chaotic and bloody. It was totally out of control until Napoleon rose up in 1799 
led a coup d'etat and took over the government, and he brought stability. Now, it was through a militaristic rule, and he was a military, military dictator in sorts. However, in the beginning, he was looked upon as a savior of the common man, and he marched across Europe, overthrowing royal house after royal house, defeating countries. And what was amazing is a lot of the people in these countries liked it. They liked Napoleon. Uh, I mentioned Beethoven. Beethoven liked Napoleon until he wanted to become an emperor, and then he tore up all this stuff. The uh, Third Symphony, he dedicated Napoleon. He called it the Heroic or the Eroka Symphony, and when Napoleon wanted to be an emperor, he changed that, scratched that off that symphony. Uh, Napoleon was a disappointment to a lot of people because when it was all said and done, he saw himself as just another elitist noble after he had deposed all these other nobles. Well, Napoleon influenced Europe by basically creating the countries that we know today in Europe. He set boundaries, um, and he brought a certain stability through his conquest. Uh, all that ended in Russia when he marched into Russia and could not defeat Russia, and he marched out. It was a tragedy, but then when he came to Waterloo, it, it did finally end. That was his downfall. But Napoleon, you have to look at him and realize that he influenced the development of Europe uh, in ways that you know never really fathomed. Now, next slide, um, which I think is slide four. I talk about the Romantic era from 1820 to 1900. This is the whole era, by the way. These are some of the characteristics that will go all the way through the period, not just the early. But Romanticism itself is a stress on emotion and freedom of expression. So when we talk about Romantic music, we're going to see emotion and this freedom to express it any way we can. Uh, I mentioned the fact that art uses more colors. They reveal the emotions the same way that music will use new harmonies. A lot of them inspired by Beethoven, by the way. Uh, humanism, which celebrated man and his unity, now shifted to a more personal idea. This is where narcissism comes in. They had been all in favor of humanism and helping one another, the brotherhood of man. Now it was more about helping me. Uh, I want to succeed. I want to achieve. Uh, maybe that was from Napoleon, too, because the soldiers were lifted up and they wanted to get stuff and they wanted to be wealthy themselves. It, it may sound simplistic, but greed has always been one of the most motivating uh, ideas throughout history. People want other people's stuff, and they go to war, and they take it, and we label them as evil and greedy. Uh, if you're one of the winners, though, you just say, no, I'm a conqueror, and I'm going to take over. Uh, I could talk about that for a while, too. The one thing I do want you to notice here is number four on this slide. This is a literary age, but they focus on the supernatural. You may not be aware of it, but I point out here, Mary Shelley, she writes the book Frankenstein during this time. Now, what is Frankenstein? Well, we know that it's a story about a monster created by Dr. Frankenstein and throws people in the well and stuff like that. The basic core of it, though, it is a sort of a perverted way of looking at man and God because the monster represents humanity, and Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, represents God, and so it is humanity seeking the creator. That's what that story is all about. The monster leaves, and then the rest of the time he is seeking to reunite with Dr. Frankenstein, his creator. Uh, and tragically, at the end of the book, uh, the monster gets the Frankenstein, and they die at the, you know, at the, the Arctic, uh, frozen to death. And uh, but people don't look at it that way because we just see the, the giant with the bolts in his neck at Halloween. Um, Edgar Allan Poe is writing during this period. And his poetry, uh, not all of it's weird. We, we give him this idea that his po all his poetry is weird. It's not all weird. He was weird. He was a very odd man. Uh, but he's writing. But to balance that, you'll see the writings of Walter Scott, who wrote Ivanhoe. Now, if there had been no Ivanhoe, we would have a totally different opinion of knights in shining armor. Uh, what Scott did was he romanticized the concept of knights and chivalry. You know, chivalry came from the King Arthur legend, but we never really knew if King Arthur existed. 
Instead, we thought of knights as these bullies and guys who during the uh, Middle Ages went around and just took things. They had weapons, they had horses, they had bands of men. They were like marauders who would take things, build a castle, call themselves a lord. But here comes Scott, and he, he sort of redoes that image based upon the Arthurian legend. And he comes up with this guy named Ivanhoe, who is the greatest of knights, most chivalrous, most honorable, uh, sacrifice everything, his armor always shines. Uh, and that's where we get our idea. Now, you go with that, and you get a blend of romanticism and fantasy. Victor Hugo's writing. Now, a lot of us, I, I love Victor Hugo. Uh, the uh, novels he writes, but the one, that, well, one of the ones he is very famous for is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a perfect romantic novel because here again, we have these themes. They're rather anti-religious, the same way that Frankenstein was sort of anti-religious in that the monster was a man seeking God. Here we have a deformed, misshapen person taking sanctuary in the church where he's treated terribly. Uh, and then he falls in love with the innocence and the beauty of Esmeralda. Uh, but there is a shadowy priest figure in this. So it's a slap at the church. The priest figure is lusting after Esmeralda. Uh, Quasimoto tries to protect her, and it ends, you know, sort of tragic. Now, the Disney version, they turned into a musical, the happy, happy hunchback. Uh, and added some songs, so I don't really put much stock in that. But if you read this story with the the critical eye of saying this is not about uh, a romance, it's a it's a fantasy that sort of slaps the church, uh, and a lot of that was going on. Now, next as far as our writers is Charles Dickens. I'm sure you've read Dickens, Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, but his most famous novel for us is probably A Christmas Carol. But what we don't realize is that A Christmas Carol is a Christmas story which doesn't feel like a Christmas story. It's set around Christmas, so every year at Christmas, uh, dozens, it seems like, versions pop up on TV. I'm an addict. I'm, I, I love to watch Christmas Carol, the old versions. I don't like the new ones so much. I didn't like Jim Carrey's version. I wasn't even that crazy about Patrick Stewart's version or um, that other guy. I forget what his name is, but anyway. The old ones, black and white, I like them. But the the thing we miss sometimes is that it's not a Christmas story. It's just set at Christmas. It's actually a supernatural ghost story. It's talking about a moral play of a man who was immoral, who gets a second chance to correct his immorality before he dies. And he does that through contact with the spirit world. And the spirit world comes to him and leads him into a new way of living. Uh, so it's a ghost story. And uh, when you first saw it, first time I saw it, it scared me a little bit. I was just a kid. Uh, but that's part of the theme here of the Romantic period. The other thing, number five on this, I talk about the fascination with nature. Because if you're looking, it's interesting how nature and spirituality seem to go hand in hand. You know, when we look at the spirit world, we try to see it reflected in the natural world. You know, the beauty of flowers. Here we're coming into the spring and we're looking at all the places where flowers are growing. It's a miracle. A dead plant springs back to life and produces the most beautiful flower. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a miracle before our very eyes. Uh, the other thing uh, is there's still, Napoleon gave us the theme of heroism and stuff again. And then later on, I mentioned that the Industrial Revolution, which brings about social and economic change on a very broad scale. The poor are still poor, and they stay poor, but they have jobs that allow them to be lifted up just a, a slight bit. You know, before labor unions, you know, people made a, a, a little bit of money, and it allowed them to live semi-comfortably. Uh, but the captains of industry, they were way up there. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to go to, um, go to Biltmore House. It's a good example. Uh, I think it was built by the Vanderbilts. The Biltmore House in Asheville is, was their summer cottage is what they called it. Two million square feet cottage. They had a bigger house in New Jersey. They would come down to Asheville where it was cooler in the summertime and live in this place. Today, people go there and they just ooh and ah, they look at this. But that building is built on the French Chateau style. Uh, 
uh, of a castle is sort of a, a throwback to the Romantic era, uh, the gardens alone. But these are the things to look for. Now, what else are we going to look for? Uh, the artwork, I give you a view of Constable, who is one of my favorite English artists. This is a view of the Stour from Dedham. And what you're looking at in this picture on the slide uh, five is this idea of realism in art. And realism in art balanced with spiritualism in music. And later in art, there's another painting which is not part of the Romantic period, but it fits better. And that's on the slide six. Uh, it's a painting by a Swiss artist, Henry Fuseli, and uh, it's it's a misinterpreted painting, for one thing. It's got an imp or a succubus sitting on this woman's chest, and it's got a horse's head sticking through the curtain. People looked at that, and they began to think of sexual symbolism. It's not a sexual symbolic painting. It's about the feeling you get when you're having a nightmare where your chest gets heavy, and it's a nightmare. The mare, the horse, is a mare. And that's the idea there. And what it is, was they'd say some evil spirit would sit upon your chest and trying to stop your heart. And that's when you had a nightmare. You, a lot of people wake up from nightmare gasping for breath. And that's what he tries to capture in this painting, which, by the way, uh, was painted prior to the Romantic. It's been painted in 1781. Uh, but it became very popular in the Romantic period because you got this beautiful young damsel in distress lying there stretched out on the bed with this evil thing sitting on her. And then the mayor sticks his head in. It's a nightmare. Um, but again, it's the art. It's sort of graphic. Now, I, I come to the part where I have a picture of Edgar Allan Poe. And a lot of folks may not know this, but Poe spent some time here in South Carolina at Sullivan's Island. And I put a letter in here because the whole thing is sort of funny. Poe, for some reason, joined the army and he was stationed on Fort Moultrie there on Sullivan's Island. If you go to Sullivan's Island, uh, you'll see Poe hats everywhere. They got a raven on them. There's some of them are black with a raven or some of them white with a black raven. Uh, there's a little restaurant there. I grabbed a sandwich at one day and they had all this Poe paraphernalia all over the walls. Uh, and then you visit Fort Moultrie uh, and uh, Sullivan's Island, a nice place, but they really capitalize on the fact that Poe was there. Poe was there, but if you, well, let me read this letter. It's, it's humorous. Uh, Poe had been in the military for a while, but he didn't like the, all the orders and being bossed around. And he made friends with one of the commanding officers who treated him sort of special. And he sort of took advantage of it and got in trouble. So he wrote a letter and he says, I've been in the American army as long as suits my ends or my inclination. It's now time that I should leave it to the effect I made this known to my circumstances to, to Lieutenant Howard, who promised me my discharge solely upon a reconciliation with yourself. That's the colonel. Um, in vain, I told him that your wishes for me, as your letters assured me, were and had always been those of a father and that you were ready to forgive me even the worst offenses. He insisted upon my writing you and that if a reconciliation could be effected, we would grant me my wish. This was advised in the goodness of his heart and with a view of serving me in a double sense. He's always been kind to me and in many respects remind me forcibly of yourself. This is a smoozy letter to the colonel uh, who he had gone to his house supposedly to party and offended some of the guests and so he was no longer, he was persona non grata with the colonel. So now he wants out and the lieutenant says, well, if the colonel lets you go, I will discharge you. So he wrote this letter saying it's time for me to leave. Uh, it, it's, it's humorous to think of how naive he is thinking, well, I joined the army, I didn't like it, so I'll just go. So let me go. Uh, what's even more humorous, they did let him go, they discharged him. Uh, but Poe wrote things like L. R. E. from the Gold Bug. Uh, but you know, Poe was sort of like other artists, like Van Gogh. Van Gogh never sold uh, actually a single painting, except for one to his brother while he was alive. And yet we see him as a great artist today. Uh, Poe never made much money off his poetry. I think he won a Chicago poetry contest for $200. And that seems to be the height of his poetry. Uh, but now we look at his poetry and everybody says, oh, I love it. Uh, nine times out of 10, they love the Raven. Quote the Raven nevermore. And they don't know much else about Poe. But he was a good example
of this somber, melancholy poetry guy. Now, let's move on. Uh, I, I say here there's some contemporary connections that you should make. And I mentioned, take a moment to note the similarities between the turn of the century from the 1790s to the 1800s and compare them to the turn of the century from the 1990s to the 21st century. Because if you look at what happened in the 1990s up through the, the war in the 21st century, the same characteristics apply. There was a fascination with the supernatural. There was a fascination with religion, which wasn't in the 1800s, but everybody thought the end of the world was coming. Seems like every time the century changes, they think the end of the world is coming. Uh, but there was this idea of emotionalism and narcissism, which are still with us today. Just turn on the news and you can see it. Uh, we live in a day and age where reason is being set aside. And I'm not going to lecture you on this, but consider this. Uh, we have taken science and used it as the basis of all sorts of things until it doesn't fit. And then we say, well, the science doesn't apply. What applies is social structure. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this, but we live in an age where there's science and there's social structure. If the science doesn't give us what we want, we claim social structure does. A good example, and I don't want to offend anybody, but a good example is the debate over transgender right now. Science tells us that a man is... Uh, has XY chromosomes and a female has two X chromosomes. That's the science. Now there are some abnormalities that occur where you may have two X and a Y and you have someone who has certain tendencies. Um, a female may have some male tendencies or a male may have some female tendencies, but science calls those anomalies or abnormalities. People today like to say, oh, that's how I'm made. But if you were born with you know, three eyes, would you say, oh, I'm supposed to have been this. This is normal. It's an abnormality. Uh, transgenderism doesn't fit in there because no one is born a boy and becomes a girl. The chromosomes don't change. So science doesn't fit. So they just scrap science. Now they go to social uh, identities and social or cultural things. And they say, well, I identify myself as this. Well, that's fine. You can identify yourself however you want, but truth is the, the standard. If I were to tell you right now that I identify myself as a 16-year-old girl, you'd laugh. Now, some people say, oh, well, I'm going to call you a, a she or whatever pronoun you want. We're in this debate. But the science tells me I'm not a 16-year-old girl. I'm a 69-year-old man, and I still got my XY chromosomes. I didn't get two X's and I didn't revert. Uh, it's interesting how everybody wants to say, well, I can change my gender, but I can't change my age. You know, but they're both on the same continuum. Uh, I can't tell everybody I'm 15 years old. They would just look at me and say, well, man, you've had a rough 15 years. But think about that because that's what we're doing now. The similar things, not as far as sexuality, was going on in the... Uh, romantic period as people began to take certain, I guess you say, leeway with fact, because now they want to go into the spiritual realm. Uh, God becomes less relevant as they say, well, I want to talk to this spirit or that spirit. And you had people popping up to take advantage. Um, there was an interest in individualism, personal wealth, greater access to information and technology, fascination with supernatural. All those characteristics come from the 1800s. But every one of them could be applied to the 21st century. Individualism, personal wealth, access to information. Uh, some of you may not realize, but the internet is rel still relatively new. It wasn't in homes until about around 96 is when it became more common. Uh, you could get an Apple computer uh, way back there, but usually those were consigned to classrooms and to libraries where you just did stuff on a floppy disk for those who remember what that is. <clears throat> then you had a personal computer make its appearance. Uh, eight inch screen, five gig of RAM, a real hustler. But today we have computers. This computer I'm looking at right here uh, is faster and more powerful than any computer up before the 2015. Uh, but now we're getting more, but that's beside the point. 
the next slide is about musical characteristics. And we're going to talk about the greater depth of emotions in music. We'll talk about greater range and pitch. Uh, music is even closely linked to art and painting. The stress on individual style, you'll see that everybody has their own style. And then you have tonal pictures. Now, there's a thing coming in this. Before we had uh, word painting way back there, this is going to take a new shape of tone painting to where they write harmonies to reflect what's being said. And, you know, it's not just notes going up and going down to reflect going up. And now it's going to be harmonies. Minor keys are very popular. You'll hear that in the story song called The Earl Kernigan. Uh, you can listen to that. I've got a sample of it. Nationalism, patriotic things are popular. And then here's the biggie, program music. What is program music? Program music is music that is used to describe a story or an emotion, something in nature. I think I give you the example of the Shmetana's The Mold Out. I don't know if it's, it may not be in this sample, but it'll be in the next one. Program music is literally where you try to reflect what's going on in nature. I mean, if I were looking out the window at the trees and stuff, I'd try to write music that made people think of that. And it's it's sort of a psychological thing where if you see, like Schubert will write a symphony called The Trout. And in that, he tries to portray a fish jumping. Fine, then I'm sorry. I've got another phone call that come in. Uh, but Moldau writes one on a river and it's amazing how when you listen to it, you can literally see the stream become a river and the crashing waves. You, you hear all that. It's, it's a brilliant piece of music, but program music is all sorts of things. Uh, Beethoven, the sixth symphony was considered programmatic. His third symphony was a little bit too. Uh, with that, we have more colorful harmonies. We have things called chromatics, which I'm not going to try to explain to you but you get all these weird chords. Then there is the ranges, the tem tempo, everything like that. Now, the next section, I have chosen uh, five, let me look at that again, five uh, composers that I want you to be aware of. And these are the early romantic composers. The Franz Schubert, Hector Berlioz, Felix Mendelssohn, and Frederick Chopin. Uh, I'm going to just go through these briefly for the sake of time, but you can read a little more about them in this. Schubert will be famous for his songwriting. In German, a song is called A Lied, and he writes all these beautiful songs. He wrote over 600 pieces of music that includes symphonies and lots of leads and things like that. So he rivaled Mozart as far as his output of music. He's in Germany. Now, in France, there's a guy named Hector Berlioz, and Berlioz will write what is called the Symphony Fantastique, and he dedicates it to Harriet Smithson. And there's a tragic story in all of these people. Schubert's tragic story was that he wanted to be a member of the Royal Guard, but you had to be six feet tall, and he was only 5'2", so they laughed at him. Uh, he goes off to prove himself in the bordellos and gets syphilis and dies. Uh, Berlioz wants to marry Harriet Smithson. He sees her in a play. He writes a symphony and dedicates it to her, and she never speaks to him until she comes back to France, finds out this guy's written a symphony, and she just goes gaga. She meets him, and they, they get married, and they live happily ever after for two years, and then she realizes she liked the music better than the composer, and they got a divorce. Uh, Felix Mendelssohn, it's not too tragic other than the fact that he was a classical-style composer in the Romantic period, but what he does do is he rediscovers uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's music, which had been lost for a period. And he pulls it out and gives us Bach. We would have not had Bach if it had been for this guy. And that's sort of his claim to fame. And then there's Frederick Chopin, who is a Polish slash French composer. And his tragic story is he wrote some of the most beautiful music, but he wanted to be a virtuoso performer. But he wrote music that he even struggled to play himself. Other Pianists would come in and play his music, and they think that's the most brilliant stuff we've ever heard. And he got with a guy named Franz Liszt, who tried to help him be a better pianist, and couldn't. But Chopin helped Liszt become a better composer, which he did become a better composer. But Chopin's sad story was that um, he fell in love with a woman who was an author. She couldn't get her books published, so she wrote under the pseudonym of George 
I think it was George Sand, who was a man. When they saw it was written by a man, they published and she was very successful, but she could never tell anybody that she was actually a woman. And so uh, there's, I think, on one of these slides, I'll show you a picture of her. Yeah, um, it's on slide 17, you'll see her. Uh, she published her books under the name of George Sand. And what was sort of weird about it was Chopin used to take her on dates and he would say, well, you know, who's your lovely, you know, woman here? He would introduce me and say, but I'm actually in love with George Sand. And that got people thinking Chopin was gay because he says, I'm in love with George Sand. They didn't know he was making a joke about her because she wrote under the name of George Sand. Uh, they, I don't think they ever got married, uh, but she stayed with him even to the point where he, he was dying of tuberculosis. But that was just one of the many odd and sad stories of this period. Uh, now, after that, we talk about Robert Schumann, his wife, Clara, which is another sad story. Robert Schumann was another composer who wanted to be a virtuoso performer, but uh, his hands wouldn't let him. And his wife, Clara, he taught her and she was about half his age, and he married her. Uh, the weird thing was he had to sue the father to get permission to marry the daughter, but they did get married, and they were very much in love, and she became a very well-known pianist. The tragedy was Schumann wanted to be the pianist and composer, and his wife was the pianist. He was the composer. Uh, some say this drove him mad. They may have. He was sick at one point. She was out making money as a pianist, and so they had a friend come and stay with her husband, and that guy's name was Johannes Brahms, and he lived in a little small cottage behind their house, and when she came home, you know, he would stay in the cottage, and she would look after her husband, but later, when her husband died, well, actually, when all of them died, they found all these letters from Clara to Brahms professing love. Now, a lot of people have gone to great lengths to say these two carried on a illicit affair, but if you read the letters, what's clear is they didn't do anything except fall in love with each other and write letters back and forth. And what's weird is when her husband died, you think, well, now they can get together. Brahms refused and moved to Berlin and said, if we get married, people will think we had an affair and it'll look bad on you. And he said, I, I wouldn't do that to your reputation. And so he broke it off with her, never saw her again. He later on got married, you know, had some kids. Uh, she went on to play Schumann's music and talk about Schumann for the rest of her life. Tragic, but it's romantic. And that's what we see with all of these people. Uh, but if you read through the slides, you'll see pictures of them and, you know, what happened. Um, slide 22, I talk about program music again. I give some of the characteristics. And I mentioned Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. Then there's some other composers, such as Tchaikovsky uh, will write later in this period, and he writes the 1812 Overture, which is about the Battle of Waterloo, really. Smetana writes some other. Dukakis, or Dukas, writes a thing called The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which you may have seen as a Disney film with Mickey Mouse. Uh, Berlioz writes the Symphony Fantastic, which is also another of those. And then finally, uh, the last slide, slide 23, is the test. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to give you these terms and definitions. I'm just going to have you do a match. And that will be the test for the early romantic. Now, all of this will be posted, and you'll be able to look at this and run through it. I think you'll find it very interesting. I do encourage you to listen to the music because you're going to see a, a greater depth of new music being created here during the early romantic. And then wait till we get to the late romantic. It's a killer. But I'm sorry if I went too fast or if I talked too fast, but we had a lot to cover in this. If you have questions, you can always text me or call me or email me. But that's the gist of this uh, period. And like I said, I know your great interest is that test. So that will be your test. Again, any questions, let me know. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this romantic period. Really a beautiful time. Thanks.